Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CEA's conversation webinar series. Canadian Electricity Association is the voice of the electricity industry in Canada. My name is Farhan Mirza, and I'm pleased to be your host for today's webinar. The conversation series features presentations from CEA's corporate partners, and the series will highlight a variety of Canadian and international solutions to current and future challenges faced by the industry. Working with CEA's corporate partners, these webinars will uh, have been developed to be of specific interest to those working in the electric utility space from generation through to the customer. For a list of upcoming sessions, check out CEA's website at electricity.ca. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items. Our session today is scheduled to run from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Questions can be asked and we would encourage you to do so as they come up uh, by typing them into the chat function. Uh, you can see that on your screen there. Uh, they're going to be asked throughout the presentation. A brief survey will be sent to webinar participants following the session today, and we very much appreciate your feedback and uh, would love to uh, hear about any topics you would like to see in the conversation series in the future. Uh, please keep an eye out for future webinars and events through CEA's monthly newsletter, Current Affairs. Uh, with over 6,000 subscribers, Current Affairs is the place to go for Canadian industry news as we connect the national value chain from generation through to the customer. If you'd like to receive current affairs, you can subscribe to this free publication via CEA's website at electricity.ca. Today, PwC Canada will present our webinar on cybersecurity, understanding an OT attack. Cybersecurity has been identified as a top risk across the power sector, and more broadly, by critical infrastructure providers. But what does that mean? And how do we connect these broad and top management concerns to meaningful security systems and data to inform a risk-based action plan? During this webinar, our panelists will discuss how to secure cloud operations, talk about an anatomy of an OT attack, and how to defend it. They will go over an in-depth security controls for mitigation and how organizations can design, build, and pilot a cybersecurity program supported by robust risk tools. At the end of today's discussion, we hope to leave you with a number of key takeaways. You will learn about designing, building, and piloting a cybersecurity program supported by robust risk tools and the ongoing monitoring of the program. You'll know the key drivers and considerations for cloud transformation, including privacy, compliance, and cybersecurity. You'll participate in a review of an OT cyber attack and learn in de um, defense in depth security controls that should be in place to reduce an OT cyber risk. Joining us today for uh, today's discussion from PwC Canada's cybersecurity, privacy, and financial crime team, our partner, Richard Wilson, managers, Dan Mara and Iman Hamad, and directors, Puneet Daya and Chris Hunter. Welcome everyone to CEA's conversation series. Richard, I'll pass it over to you to start us off. Terrific, thanks Ryan, appreciate it. Hello everybody, welcome. Um, yeah, today we're gonna dive into uh, a good overview of understanding of an OT attack. And, and as my team and I really talked through this, we saw a broader set of the implications and controls that are around it. And so we're gonna try to, um, to, to go through a number of those. Um, and so, We'll go into the anatomy of an OT attack, and, and we could spend an hour just, you know, on that that topic or, or two hours alone. Um, but we'll give you a, sort of a good anatomy of what we're seeing from some of our, our OT specialists, and then we're going to tie it into some of the other controls. Like, what role does cloud play in this? Is actually quite interesting. Um, and then we'll take a look at, at the overall risk dialogue and the risk as a capability and how you position your OT program and, and strategically position it. To, up through to your board. Uh, throughout, please ask questions and then we'll have lots of uh, Q&A um, at the end as well. So let's move ahead. Okay, a couple of quick thoughts just before we dive into this. Um, we know that we've got both technical and um, non-technical uh, audience members today. We're gonna touch on both. So when we get into the technical topic, don't worry, it's not gonna be all talking about, you know, AD and PLCs and a whole bunch of other you know, multi-letter acronyms. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll touch on both sides. Uh, this is not a sky is falling team, right? So this is not a fear mongering conversation today. This is practical. It's about, you know, what can we actually do to understand um, the OT environment and to secure it better? In general, what we're seeing at the board and management level is that while board management teams aren't seeing that OT cyber risk is as low as they would ultimately like to see it and are targeting for. They know good work is happening by a lot of smart people. We see that. 
and um, and you know we'll just encourage you to continue that work and we'll give you some messaging to help um, manage those expectations and manage also the expectations that new threats are going to continue to happen and it's it, they, they continue to emerge we'll always need to stay out ahead of those so with that I'm going to turn it over to uh, to my clever panelists let's uh, just go through a quick intro with that team and if we go to the next slide I can turn it over to Chris to begin Thanks, Rich. Um, you promised I could talk about AD and PLCs today. That's that's at least the PLCs part. That that's part of the reason I'm here. Um, <laughs> Chris Hunter. I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, spent all my career building, maintaining, and securing OT and ICS systems for both Canadian and global power sector clients. Spent the last two years at uh, at the PwC uh, cyber team, um, helping to build out uh, their operational technology security practice. Aman? Thanks, Chris. Uh, my name is Iman Hamad. Uh, I am an electrical engineer, engineer by training. I come with 20 years of experience combining communication technology control and cybersecurity. I've been part of the industrial and IoT security team at PwC, focusing on critical infrastructure system security and operational resilience. Thrilled to be here and looking forward to our communication uh, discussion. All right, uh, Puneet here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I work uh, to lead uh, our cloud security services practice. Uh, the background is, is technology. I've worked with clients across FS and power sector uh, to help them uh, enable secure cloud migration as they go through these journeys uh, across APAC and North America and uh, looking forward to the chat today. Dan? Nice one, Puni. Hi, everybody. So Dan Mara here. I've got uh, seven plus years practicing in the cybersecurity risk management space. So that's both designing the underlying risk models and also the accompanying governance models for implementation of each of those. Uh, so, and this has often supported a lot of the cybersecurity strategies that our clients have come up with uh, over the last few years. Uh, clients have stretched coast to coast in Australia, uh, Canada, and also the United States, uh, covering generation, transmission, distribution, uh, as well as uh, gas as well. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. Okay, let's dive into it. Let's have some fun. So we've got um, a pretty busy slide here that Iman will just uh, break down for us a little bit around the OT cyber threat landscape. Again, huge topic, but do you want to give us a quick summary on that, Iman? Thanks, Rich. And uh... Yes, so if we are going to discuss today uh, one example of an OT attack, let's uh, get a view of what we are up against. So to understand what's happening out there. So this this slide presents a summary of um, cyber incident events targeting uh, the power sector in 2019. And if we select one example, uh, we will see, for example, in North America and the US, um, in September 2019, several utilities were targeted by um, a malware, look back malware. Uh, that's just one example. And, um, and digging deeper into these um, several incidents, we see a, a trend. So the, the uh, this trend translates to the top threats that we're looking at uh, in the power sector. At number one, we're looking at ransomware. And uh, this will be informative for the OT attack example that we will discuss in a few minutes. This, this is followed by phishing activity, and phishing activity is just um, the initial uh, threat actor set of actions to gain, to proceed to either plant a ransomware or to breach the data in uh, the power system uh, cor uh, corporate. Finally, um, as we know, power sector is mainly targeted by um, threat actors that are determined and informed, so this will usually target causing uh, targeted disruptions in, the, uh, in these um, utilities or facilities. Um, with that in mind, we would like to get a better understanding of why is this still happening? And uh, a good lens into that will be uh, discussed by Chris. Over to you, Chris. Sounds good, thank you, Iman. Uh, again, a lot of information on this slide. Um, what uh, what this is uh, intending to show um, through the the work that we've done with with operational technology and IT security and OT security teams over the last few years in Canada, um, we we see that the high and medium impact uh, you know cyber assets 
they get all of the or the majority of the you know security resources when we look at OT um, and, and and OT security. Um, the intent of this is to show that um, you know the, the the bulk of the focus is of course um, you know focused on securing the bulk electric system and the you know the systems and assets that support that bulk electric system, primary control centers, cross border HVDC systems, provincial interties. Um, as, as we move a little bit to the right, um, you know, the regulatory frameworks do provide some guidance across, um, you know, lower impact to the, you know, the, the electric system, uh, some of the renewable generation facilities that are growing, um, more of the, you know, the MV and HV stations, some of the distribution management systems, uh, still, it's still a fair amount of, of attention and focus. You know, today we, we, I don't want to talk a lot about these two. Um, I think most organizations um, have done a great job in building out security around um, these high-value key assets. The you know the area that um, that that doesn't get enough attention and, and in some cases doesn't get any attention or they're not sure who's supposed to provide the attention is as we move further to the right of this. So there is a fair amount of assets that uh, you know that are still ICS operational technology assets that are not regulated by the, you know, the bulk electric system requirements. So saying that those assets are not, you know, they're, they're not regulated by, you know, the broader system operators, but they still could be extremely valuable and actually have a large impact on power sector organizations. So just because it's not a regulatory push, it does not mean that these assets and systems do not have, uh, you know, high value and a huge impact if something happens to them. Um, we'll get into this a little bit further um, in the discussion um, as Dan dives into this, is, is to figure out how, how, how you can tackle this. You know, there is no regulatory framework. It's, 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 it's too exhaustive to use um, you know, the medium and high standards to meet some of these. Um, the, the, the concern and what we're seeing is um, also in this other technology category, this bucket is growing. When we talk about organizations moving into broader analytics platforms, working towards asset maintenance and asset management, working on you know, getting a smarter grid. Is it OT? Is it IT? Um, you know, Puneet's gonna get into some stuff a little bit later when we throw um, you know, some of the data or some of the analysis, um, or some of the cloud tools, I'll call them, that, that creates a, a gray area as well. So, so the intent of this is just to give a bit of a footprint on you know, large technology landscape, Yes, in some areas, there's been great work that's been done, but there's huge parts of uh, you know, the technology footprint that is not getting the attention it needs. Um, and, and we'll dive into you know, what does it look like to, to tackle all of this forgotten or lost uh, you know, technology. They're maintained, you know, people use the technology, but when it comes to you know, security, you know, security and securing those technologies, that's what we're trying to focus on. You know, how do we get into the ones that really aren't driven by, you know, the regulatory frameworks and making sure that um, you know, organizations are protected and can put a program in place that meets the balance of reducing cyber risk, but also understanding that um, the cost and effort is always a factor in, in figuring out that right balance. Next, we'll take a, take a quick walk through, um, you know, as the, as the title of the, the discussion today, you know, presents itself, um, we'll talk through what, what, what a cyber attack looks like, um, you know, for an operational technology, you know, set of systems. Um, for those that are um, you know, fluent on, you know, the different approaches, you know, you'll recognize that this takes the uh, you know, cyber, you know, kill chain methodology. Um, you know, it's a, it, it is a, uh, you know, a, a good approach to walk through, you know, where could there have been better controls in place to stop this and, you know, what went wrong and why things went wrong. So, so this particular event that we're going to talk about, um, you know, this is a fairly sophisticated threat actor. They were looking for financial gain, so they had financial more, you know, motivations. Um, they targeted and understood that, you know, public IPPs, um, you know, although may not have the same level of uh, requirements because they're not, you know, bound by, you know, the medium and high requirements, still have a significant impact on on the power system and the power grid. So, so they did some research. They dug around to, you know, to identify through, you know, through LinkedIn, some folks that were, you know, protection and control technologists, worked for small companies, um, established a connection with, um, with, with one of the PNC, you know, techs, um, impersonated a recruiter, 
um, started transferring, you know, emails to, to, to start a dialogue about maybe a, a position that was a little bit more, more lucrative for this contractor. Um, as, as we work through the, you know, the discussions, once those files are transferred, um, that's when, you know, the, the foothold is established. So the threat actor did get, uh, did get access to the, you know, the, the, the laptop that the contractor would use for work um, and, you know, did establish remote access. So at that point, you know, the threat actor had the ability to, um, you know, to transfer files. Um, basically, you know, payloads were, were able to be transferred to that, uh, you know, that mobile, that mobile laptop. Um, you know, next up is, as time progressed, the, you know, the threat actor kept monitoring, okay, what, what exactly is this individual doing? And lo and behold, the, the individual had the ability to remotely connect to several facilities using his own asset. I was able to actually connect with this asset, um, you know, both, um, you know, both locally on, on, on corporate at some of these sites, but also on the ICSS, you know, on the ICS networks as well. So as we work through the, you know, the steps of the situation, Laptops infected. Contractor has physical access and has remote access using his own, you know, his own his own laptop into these. Um, the the threat actor is starting to get a, a much better view of what technology the individual has access to. Start digging around to find some of the uh, the vulnerabilities. Um, talk a little bit about uh, jump on the the next step here, Iman. Thanks, Chris. That's fascinating. So um, now our contractor has been uh, exploited and somebody is acting through him on our network. Uh, next step, they will, after exploration and understanding the environment and getting to the target assets, they understand, they look deeper into the assets and understand which ones are more exploitable, which ones have weaknesses. And these weaknesses are not surprising. It's either an older operating system, unpatched system, or an end of life uh, PLC. So they mark their actual targets now. And they, for example, um, in this scenario, let's consider an unpatched Windows domain controller. They will infect uh, with the malware. And in the next step, they will establish the backdoor communication to the remote command and control servers. Once that is established, uh, then the, the ransomware is actually deployed directly through the, that connection to the endpoints and the core systems. So far, we have no indication as uh, the operator of what's going on. And then the screen uh, appears once the encryption is, starts occurring and the file systems and the backups are looked out. We get an indication and then, Chris, what will happen? Yeah, uh, and, and, you know, great steps through your mind. And I think the, uh, you know, as this progresses, the, you know, in this case, the, the threat actor identified and was able to deploy across several facilities around the same time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the the intent in this case was was financial. Um, so there were enough mechanisms in place to to shut down these facilities in an organized, uh, safe manner. Um, what they did go after was, you know, they knew and and they did, you know, leak to the media that that this was happening. Um, several of these producing facilities had to shut down. As the backups were um, also only kept locally, you know, they were also encrypted. It took a while to stand the systems back up. So, so, so they did go after, you know, you know, the share price obviously was going to take a hit. Um, price of power, even though these weren't, uh, you know, core to the system, did bump up the price of power at the power pool. And they did go after a ransom. Um, you know, that was kind of the third and, and kind of their last, last piece of it. I think one of the important things to look at on this is this doesn't happen over three or four days. This is a very long process. Um, targets are identified, research is done, um, you know, this could be six, eight, you know, nine months in, in duration and multiple, you know, multiple victims that, that they would pursue and, you know, pursue the ones that actually you know, turn out to be successful. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so no shortage of, um, of insights around that. And obviously it's a very complex process uh, that we see happen. Um, so why don't we now do a bit of a transition to um, Panit, and I think what we're going to do is, is talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, I guess the, 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 compo the component around cloud adoption. Um, we've obviously seen within the power sector um, quite a significant shift moving in, um, in the use of cloud, both in IT and OT. Um, and so Panit, why don't you dive into that a little bit, give us a sense of, you know, how is it affecting asset management or you know uh, applications things along those lines 
just a note to the audience, we're gonna go a little bit more technical on this one, um, and then we're gonna bring it back to some business logic with uh, with Dan. So if uh, if Panit gets a little bit more technical, have faith, we'll come back to uh, a business discussion as well. <laughs> sure, Rich, uh, and uh, thanks, Chris and Iman. So, <clears throat> excuse me, IT and OT integration has been well underway last several years to, incre to increase distribution system performance, reliability, and improve customer satisfaction. Now enter cloud. So cloud adoption in, in, in power sector has further blurred the demarcation and is poised to accelerate the IT-OT convergence. Application portfolios are getting hybrid with significant uh, SaaS uptake, as well as uh, a lot of core business applications and OT services, the DAS asset management, performance analytics, EMI headings, GIS, historians finding their way to the cloud. It's, it's, it's actually a three-dimensional integration now with enterprise, OT, and cloud. That, that puts customer and operational data at risk if it's not secured properly. So what we are seeing is we are seeing a lot of clients in, in power sector now adopting uh, and embracing a zero trust cybersecurity strategy since being inside the network is, is no longer considered a default trust. So the security delivery approach now needs to be completely reimagined in, in this new evolving converged world left shifting and actually embedding guardrails within the cloud delivery lifecycle. In fact, cloud actually presents opportunities to automate some of the traditional IPOT controls, such as network isolation, secure remote access, default encryption, and real-time asset and posture visibility. Now, now one of the questions that, uh, that we get asked a lot is, what, what are the top challenges from a security standpoint when it comes to cloud? Uh, given that uh, cloud is, is now beginning to take hold in uh, power and utilities. Next slide. Now, now there, are, there are a lot of challenges and opportunities when it comes to cloud in, in, in power sector, but I, I'll just uh, talk to the top three or four here real quick and, and share some insights. First and the foremost, I think, I think a lot of us would have seen uh, the shared responsibility model. So, so the top of the list challenge that we have seen is, how do you ensure security governance in a multi-cloud shared responsibility model? Now, as I said, a number of IT and OT services are moving to cloud. CIS, your SAP workloads, uh, a lot of data and analytics workloads, Security governance has been a consistent challenge in a multi-provider shared responsibility delivery model. And, and the complexity that, uh, that is introduced is really because now the security is not only a shared responsibility between the cloud provider and the client, but also between different security stakeholders, whether it is the platform engineering, the security function, enterprise architecture, and even an IT and OT project teams. So what we are seeing clients is, is having to redesign their target operating model to balance the need for business agility with functional independence to manage cyber risks in cloud. The next one is, uh, is the next slide please. The next one on the list is, how do you ensure consistent security control implementation in a multi-cloud ecosystem? Now, now, the challenge is, is the cloud strategy for most clients is multi-provider. And how do you ensure, given that, as you can see, uh, each of the cloud platform providers have got a number of their own native platform native security services, as well as a number of other multi-provider security technologies. There is the situation of tool sprawl with cloud provider and security vendors releasing new set of security capabilities for their platform. The choice and conflict of platform native versus multi-provider security technologies has been seen introducing risk, especially as some of these are turned on without fully operationalizing and governing, giving clients a false sense of security. To resolve this challenge, we have seen some clients adapting and 
and adopting a cloud control matrix approach, which is aligned with their cyber within their cybersecurity framework with platform specific implementation guidance. Now I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit uh, and where things uh, start getting a little more uh, technical. So the next slide. The, the number three, and, and this, is, this is big. Almost a lot of uh, cloud breaches can actually be traced back to configuration, misconfigurations in cloud environment. So configuration drifts in a volatile environment. Now with DevOps in cloud, resource and application configuration changes are happening all the time through continuous build and release cycles. It is actually hard to toll gate changes in such a volatile environment. Now misconfigurations that slip through, and, and there, are, there are multiple of those, as you can see here, are misconfigurations that slip through our security team's uh, worst nightmare. There, there have been breaches with millions of sensitive records exfiltration, account takeovers, and even complete host compromises. It is important security validations are embedded as guardrails at each stage of your deployment pipelines. And just like infrastructure and application, security policy deployment also happen through security pipelines. Next slide, please. So where does, this, where, where does the people aspect factor into this? I think another big challenge is how do you future-proof the cybersecurity teams? The cloud is the future to realize digital transformation ambitions. Nobody is disputing that anymore. Security teams across industries and more so in, in power and utilities are now actually playing catch up to technology and platform engineering groups. Based on our own PwC's and one Canadian digital survey released recently, cloud solution, as you can see, sits right at the top of this list of emerging technologies with 44% of business and technology leaders identifying this as a known gap in the organization. There is, there is an immediate need to augment capacity and upskill cybersecurity workforces in a number of areas. And, and we, have, we have sort of classified those in four core buckets. We already saw platform native security skills, whether it is uh, the, the kind of platform, SaaS, ISPS that we are using, uh, the cloud provided native technologies there, containers and server less security because more and more workloads are, are taking a microservices architecture and also getting serverless. DevSecOps integration is big because you want to integrate uh, controls within the pipeline uh, rather than having an after the fact uh, security monitoring and compliance reporting. And of course, multi-cloud technologies, whether it is your HashiCorp wall technologies, whether it is deploying infrastructure as code through Terraforms, or even in native ISC tools. The security actually needs to be embedded into the, into the pipeline to make sure that uh, consistent security controls are enforced through the pipelines and not when the infrastructure and the resources get deployed. So, so there, is, there is the need for left shifting uh, and ensuring that uh, security is big into the pipeline. And uh, the, the approach would, uh, would essentially help manage a lot of cyber risks. Uh, and my colleague, Dan, is just gonna talk to you about some, some cyber security risk management uh, best practices in, in power and sector. Over to you, Dan. Cool. Thanks very much, Puni. And uh, thanks so far, uh, Rich, Chris, uh, Iman, and, uh, and Puni for all, all the efforts here. So, um, Basically, everybody, I'm going to be talking through uh, the typical sort of steps, basically, that we would go through normally to formulate a cybersecurity strategy uh, based on all these different things that we've been talking about so far. So I might just uh, ask a presenter to jump to the next slide here. And I'm going to, it's, it's a lot of, lot of information and a little bit busy. So uh, just home in on, on sort of step number one there, and we can, um, we'll get started there and just work our way through it. So basically, up front, it's going to be really important that when you're thinking about baking risk as a capability into your strategy, you're going to need to identify your VP level personnel and their media reports and get them included right at the start, right? You need to be asking them, 
what systems matter to you and your BU the most. Uh, and it's not necessarily going to just be, uh, you know, the you know the things that are in NERC high or NERC medium, as Chris was alluding to before, right? Uh, there's a lot of non-NERC, uh, NERC low, and um, you know, and if you're a, a gas pipeline as well, it's not going to apply, right? So you need to understand and get a, an idea on that. Uh, don't assume that those that are actually responsible for administrating technology are going to be the individuals responsible for accepting risk. They're two separate things, right? So uh, that's why it's really, really important to engage with those folks, uh, operators and parts of the business that actually rely on the technology to support their key processes. Because what you'll find is a lot of power sector companies are concerned with keeping the lights on, uh, maintaining a, a culture of safety, fostering employee growth and satisfaction. There's a much broader uh, sort of remit of systems really that are out there that are gonna be needed to support the achievement of the key processes that support those corporate objectives. Uh, so the other thing too, is if you don't start talking to them now, uh, when you start bringing you know, a security architecture or drawings to them in steps five and six later on there, it's gonna be pretty tricky to get that buy-in. So step number one, uh, identify those folks and start talking to them. Moving over to step two there. So vulnerabilities and controls need to be understood after we've worked out what's important to the business. Uh, the power sector companies, you know, gas sector as well, their supporting infrastructure can vary substantially. And I think if you just, you know, just take Puneet's point, right? Uh, we, we've had, we've got cloud getting hooked up to, you know, unregulated assets, right? The list of vulnerabilities is going to be very different if you're talking about those that are in your highly regulated assets. So you can pull your trusty frameworks, draw on your, your NIST and your ISO 27002, whatever, whatever framework uh, you typically align to. And, uh, and go through the um, go through those lists to sort of make sure that you've got a, a broad sort of idea of what your system exactly is and where those vulnerabilities and concerns might start arising. Over to step three, governance, definitely the most exciting topic of all time. Uh, so this is going to be really, really important, right? It's very rare to see a future state of cybersecurity that can actually be sustained with the existing resources that you have, okay? So start thinking about what org changes are going to be needed to support the new security roles and provide the right level of oversight to those folks to see them being held accountable for the security objectives they're responsible for. Now, typically what we start seeing here is, as I said before, the business owners, so those VPs are going to have a role uh, in their direct reports. Uh, typically it's around setting the impact of the risk events that we're reporting on. Uh, tech owners as well, so those folks might be engineering, responsible, typically for likelihood reduction, stopping the, the event actually occurring. You're also to manage the risk function going to need probably a, a risk person as well as a, a security architect. And bear in mind, those folks need to get along. Uh, you might be bringing a risk person, a technology person, an engineer together, very different backgrounds, very different personalities, very, very different ideas on what's typically important. So just bear in mind, you might need to uh, have a, a bit of a cool I, have, I have so, no idea, no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. The rich, Dan, you know, we, we get along all the time. That's right. <laughs> Our priorities are always aligned. That's right. Yeah. Kumbaya. Absolutely. Kumbaya. Every day of the week, every day of the week, guys. So, uh, so yeah, so on to step four there. So yeah, so you see those dots on the heat map there, like, like here's the thing, getting that down to a subset, the list that you kind of needed to get it to, uh, is, is a tricky thing. You think back to that kill chain slide that Amon and Chris were speaking earlier on. Step number seven is actually the concern. The kill chain before that was, it should not be represented on this heat map. If you start taking vulnerability, uh, you know, scans, pen test results, uh, you know, lists that are thousands of pages long with all these concerns, if you will, about cybersecurity, if your OT environment to the executives and, and the board, if there's a desire to, to roll this up to the board and to, you know, to many companies out there, we would encourage that to be the case. Uh, they're gonna go to sleep, their eyes will glaze over or they'll, they'll have a sky is falling moment and start having allergic reactions and you're gonna have a bad time, right? So what you need to do is get yourself a risk model that adequately takes and considers all of that detailed weed information and pumps it up to these sort of heat maps that you see here, right? Which is a language that executives and boards speak in every single day of the week. It's pretty straightforward. Current state, target state. Dots on the heat map, what do we need to do to get those dots down? Uh, you gotta be getting those dots down. You hear it, hear it all the time when it comes to executives and managing risk. Step five and six, this is where you're gonna see your, your risk person that we spoke about in step three there and your security architect really coming together here. 
Uh, so they're basically going to be working out what, what are all those vulnerabilities? What are all those concerns? What can we do that's practical uh, to get those dots into a more manageable state using the risk model that we designed in step four? Uh, they're going to need to consider alternatives. So they're going to have to have a mind of query and openness to consider different sort of things, right? You might have an OT environment and you can't necessarily drop in, uh, you know, firewalls or, um, you know, you, you can't, you know, we know pat the issues around patching in a lot of these environments. So how do you, how could you perhaps segment them and automate that uh, in the meantime? Lots of different ways you can sort of swing the seesaw there, uh, but uh, it's going to be important there to have alternatives because when we start moving on to step seven there, um, that's when we've got our alternatives all sort of pulled together and someone's going to have to pay for it. Right, so start thinking about CapEx, uh, uh, OpEx, uh, whether the people that are gonna be operating this future state are gonna be in-sourced or whether they're gonna be a service provider, right? Uh, these, this is when all those decisions start happening and often it's not super easy, right? Because the executives might wanna see those black dots move down to the blue dot zone up in step four, but they can only forward the budget to go halfway or maybe even a quarter of the way in many instances. <sighs> so, on step eight, we're almost there, guys. Uh, bear with me, bear with me. So, so once Dan, it's all been agreed upon. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead, man. <laughs> when are you going to tell me when are you getting the highway on my threat actor? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, so, develop a security execution plan and roadmap. You, you guys, this is not rocket science. Just go pull out your, uh, your project management frameworks. Uh, most organizations have got one. Time quality, scope, and budget. You've got your streams that are gonna get you to that state that's in articulated in section six, just over there. And you've got executive and management and business ownership buy-in because they understand those heat maps that have been illustrated them in step four there. Nice and easy. Just, right. uh, yeah, so yeah. make sure you- yeah, And I wanna reinforce that. This is huge, you're right. It isn't rocket science because you followed the sequence, the logical sequence of events up front Right. And we've, we've seen some teams that that go from the assessment to bringing the roadmap into their executive team and the, and the executive doesn't see the logic and why we need to spend so much money or what resources you need or what sequence you're doing. That part's been missed. So, you know, the steps three to six there really help to provide the OT leadership team with a sound reason why they're asking for certain resources and why it'll take a certain amount of time to execute. Critical. I think I think to um, which you know one of the biggest steps in here is is seven which which we we continue to push. It's the when we talk resources when it comes to to people that's such a key piece that we I think we see time and time again in in, in OT. Uh, Rich, it's it's there needs to be almost a bit more of a focus that um, not. All of the you know all of the issues identified can be solved with with tools and technology. It's making sure that you know we appreciate there's going to be you know efforts going to be needed, and that might not exist right now. Um, and then, you know it's it's a key piece that uh, you know usually at least helps to to bridge some of the gaps between you know the security risk people and and, and some of the folks that uh, that use and, and and rely on the operational technologies. Yeah, you know, Chris, just to so that final thought, personally, I'm tired of people kind of flinging spears saying IT and OT aren't getting a lot. I mean, that, 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 that story is getting really old. Um, the reality is that, um, you know, the vast majority of teams we, we're working with have a very strong interest in making sure that collective effort works out. And, and the reason that this was designed was to provide a platform for those teams to actually agree on the level of risk, agree on what controls can and can't be used in an architecture. Um, and so it, it isn't that, 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 you know, there isn't this integration, is that there isn't necessarily a process underlying some of the work that, that the IT and OT teams are doing with security that, that allows them to articulate it, you know, in, in a fairly simple way for management to understand. So that was the genesis behind us, us doing this type of thing. And uh, like uh, another thought, uh, Richard and Dan here, um, this will not introduce significant delays in trying to control uh, or strengthen the security controls, right? It, it just provides a structural methodological way to address the risks at the right point. So if we go back to our threat 
actor and the scenario that we just talked about, through this process, we will identify, for example, addressing the network security uh, weaknesses, and that will handle the threat landscape that we are considering at this period of time. Yeah. A comment just came in from uh, one of the attendees, which I really like, which was, if I stop moving my window, it might actually appear for me. Come back, there we go. Which is, um, executives acknowledge cyber risk is a high priority, but it isn't truly reflected in the governance structure or even in the process. And, and so I think that we're, you know, if we we're going to take have one takeaway on on um, messaging the, the the need for OT, if you go up to the executive team and they don't resource you properly, either through insourcing or co-sourcing or budgetarily, what they'll ask you to do is just take some controls out. What you actually need to do is show them, make the linkage between number four and number seven, which is no problem. If you can't, if we can't put the the rationale in our rate case or whatever for a certain amount of of budget, then we have to accept a higher risk level. It's not that we just don't do certain projects. It's, it's you actually need to look at the implications of a lesser budget in the risk profile. When you have that dialogue, the whole OT security dialogue changes, and and so that that to us has been um, probably one of the most constructive ways to get the the conversation going. Uh, let's see now. Are we are we at the point, I guess, where we could start to entertain some more questions? Happy to do so. And I know that our moderators are going to drop some in. Yeah, Dan, why don't, why don't you sort of do a quick wrap, maybe in the next 60 seconds, and then and then let's turn uh, to questions. So I'll put a call out to our attendees. If you've got questions, start to submit, and we'll take them from there. Sure thing, team. And I think uh, thanks thanks for that, Richard. I'd say uh, these are typically some of the vulnerabilities uh, that you're going to be seeing that are going to contribute to some of those dots identified in step four there. So these are pretty typical that you'd see in an OT environment, particularly if it's not uh, a NERC high or medium uh, sort of site. Uh, if we move on to the next slide there as well, uh, the outcomes of a lot of the preliminary risk assessments that we do indeed perform. So I did see a question as well about that one. So just stressing that, yeah, we, we do actually uh, undertake this activity uh, at a lot of clients. Uh, we typically see the NERC or those regulated assets uh, down in that sort of more green and yellow zone. Impact can still be quite major, uh, but the the uh, you know the level of I guess rigor around a lot of the uh, cybersecurity components for those assets pretty good. So you can get those dots down up up in that top right corner where you're non non regulated, non NERC, and what have you. That's where a lot of the residual or current risk often sits uh, that we see uh, when we uh, when we get out and get our hands dirty with a lot of the OT infrastructure. Right. Um, and, Dan, and Dan, these these ranges that you have here come from not just obviously one client for confidentiality reasons, but this is actually um, a sort of an amalgamation of assessments that you've done across the OT environment, Canada, US in the last year or two? Is that is that how you'd characterize it? It's about right. Yep, I'd say further up in the top right corner for Australia. So uh, props for Canada for be beating Aussie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, terrific. Yeah, I'd say as well there, you, yeah, essentially moving into, this is a, a neat sort of little slide here that helps uh, illustrate, I think, more the point that you were just speaking to, Rich, right? Uh, it's that risk acceptance process. So if you have got a million dollars, uh, but you need $2 million uh, to do what you want to do to move those dots around, consider how you might reduce the implementation effort uh, that's illustrated over on the left of this graphic here to potentially reduce a bit of the risk reduction that's illustrated on the um, horizontal or the x-axis. Uh, as a sort of a, as you know, basically a compromise, right? So you don't need to do the nth degree on everything, but you do need to get started and do something, right? So if you do have restricted budget, you can slide those sort of projects up, up and around and down uh, based on what you've got in scope to try and fit the budgets that you have. But bear in mind, moving these sort of um, projects around that are illustrated here is going to affect the end state of where your risk dots end up on those heat maps. And it might be a little further up, but ultimately that is what the executives and the board and the business does need to accept uh, if there's issues with dollars and headcount uh, and what have you. So just a bit of a slide to illustrate and really drive that point home there. 
Okay, terrific. We can move on to some questions now, if you like, team. Sounds great. Okay. So we'll put the call out. If anybody has either a question or a comment, more than happy to reflect on either. Well, we, uh, while we wait there, Rich, um, did you want to make a, a bit of a comment around that recent, uh, you know, the Canadian government, you know, report that was provided on, uh, you know, some of the top threats that, um, you know, I, I was surprised to see some of the ones, I guess, that were called up for Canada. Um, anything, anything from your perspective that jumped out on that? Uh, actually, the questions are coming in fast and furious, Chris. Perfect. So hold hold that thought, or maybe you can bake your response into uh, sure. to some of the questions. Um, okay, so a question here is: Does it make sense to perpetuate the old adage of keeping OT and IT strictly separated? Or is it now time that we consider the gray areas and see how we best can support convergence? Um, if you, I, I'm happy to farm this one out or, or take a first step. Does anybody feel passionate and want to start off with this? Sure, I, can, I can jump on that one, Rich. Um, sure, Chris, go for it. I think, the, um, I think one of the concepts that we talk a lot about is you know, the concept of defense in depth. And I've got a bit of a different perspective when we talk you know, from an, from an OT background, um, I would say that the IT piece of that was integrated with OT many years ago. You know, so the second we started using Windows machines inside of, you know, power plants or inside of operating facilities, Windows servers instead of Unix servers, you know, running the, the you know, the big EMS and SCADA systems. Um, the challenge that we see is a lot of the applications that need to run on those IT machines they cannot keep up with the level of updates and patches and a lot of it driven by security these days that you know windows and some of the core infrastructure even on the networking side um, that they usually run um, so so the challenge with with the integration pieces we look at it this way is we need to make sure that in some cases we leverage a lot of the good capabilities but we do have to be cognizant that um, we will never be able to, I'll say, execute to the same level of maturity um, the controls that you would on IT. So unfortunately, there's gonna be some assets and systems where we really have to strengthen, I'll call it the perimeter and how people have asked, you know, have you know, basically access to those. Um, just because the concept of, of putting in a common vulnerability management program, for example, it's, it's still a long ways out. Um, you know, the, some of the technologies on the OT side just they cannot keep up with the changes that uh, you know, some of the vendors provide. Okay, terrific. Um, I want to introduce a question around uh, both board and management reactions to um, clouds or sorry, uh, to the OT risk profile. Um, is it a surprise to see how high the risk is and you know, what are their concerns around bringing that, that uh, risk down? Um, I'll, um, I'll chime in on that one to start with, uh, just given some of the, the board facing uh, discussions that I've had and then, and then uh, open it up as well. Um, so we've certainly had um, a, a couple of, of interesting examples where the message that came up to the board around OT risk and the threats that are related to it, um, the board may, might have taken a, a false sense of security because what was being talked about was a couple of, of controls that may be effective as opposed to the full risk profile. So when, when Dan showed that heat map, that's actually looking at the combination of all controls and defense and depth within OT. And so it's often a little unsettling for management teams and boards, frankly, to, to see what the risk level looks like, which is, oh my goodness, it's, you know, it's up in the you know, possible to probable category um, and so a couple of comments, Dan, you and I have wrestled with this one. Um, you have to also factor in the intent, which is, you know, how likely is it that somebody has the intent to do this? You know, if you're sitting in a high conflict country, it's probably higher than if you're sitting in Canada, but that doesn't mean we ever rest on our laurels. Um, what we found is that helping boards to understand the full risk spectrum of OT sooner than later is very healthy. If they have a false sense of security, then actually what will end up happening is they, they can't execute their fiduciary duty. They won't release the funding that you may need necessary in order to, to conduct the appropriate security work. 
because they think that the risk is lower than it may actually be. So for those reasons, we suggest get a, a proper risk assessment done for your OT environment um, and, and bring the truth forward because it's, um, you know, it, they tend to want to just get down to business and get, get things um, addressed once they understand what the risk profile looks like. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's one where it's really important to stay close to them and be their ally, I think, on that journey as well, Rich. Um, you, you do need to clarify those really key assumptions. Uh, a lot of the discussion we've had in our risk models has been, uh, do we assume someone is, is trying? Who is the threat actor? Uh, and there's not a lot of data out there to say how many people are actively trying to hack your organization right now. Uh, so there is a bit of fuzzy logic to it. Uh, at times, which can be frustrating, uh, particularly for, I think, a lot of the operations and engineering folks that often sit higher up in organizations that are after very clear cut results. Uh, so yeah, so bringing them on that journey, uh, not being an outlier as well. So hold, like holding their hand a little bit uh, to sort of put, a, put it bluntly really is that this is so common to see those risks up in that top right corner uh, like in this day and age right now. Uh, there's, aside from those, those OT, NERC regulated risks, like we talked about, uh, it's uh, they're all they're usually pretty good, but up in the top right corner is not uncommon. And helping your board and executives understand that they're not alone uh, can also really, really help sort of keep them calm, cool, and collected, and have that action oriented mindset for sure. Okay. Uh, there was a question. Uh, the caveat is um, we're, we're not here to promote any PwC services, so I want to stay strongly committed to that. Um, but there's a question around, you know, whether we're conducting cybersecurity reviews for the power sector um, to identify gaps. Um, and I know that uh, certainly Chris, you, Dan, Iman, you've, you've been in the heart of these conversations. So we certainly do that. The, the question is, can you talk about what are some of the best practices for having a good, healthy, open, transparent dialogue? Um, not as an auditor, but just, just as a, a team that is reviewing um, the OT environments. How do those conversations go? What um, what works well? If it, is there any nervousness around it? What have you learned over the, the past couple of years of doing this? Chris, I'll start with you. <laughs> I think there's um, all uh, you know. One of the things I'll bring up that uh, you know stood out to me as we talked through this, Rich, is is the team we've got on the panel today. Uh, you know, I'm an engineer. My background is not risk. My background is not management consulting or audit that PwC would typically do. Um, you know, you've got a specialist like Dan. Um, you've got Iman's background as well across a you know a broad variety. I, I think um, I think what we've learned is, um, you know, to be blunt, we, you can't walk into a room with folks that look after operations and look after operational technology, and start asking a lot of hardcore deep IT security questions. The conversation just, just doesn't go anywhere because you're not necessarily speaking on the same level. Um, so I think it is very important. And, and you, you you talk through this, Dan, it's, it's understanding the stakeholders and it's understanding who the important people are that are going to need to go along with this journey. Get them involved early because if you're going to, if you're not going to get any buy-in, you're not going to have any success in it. So I think we've learned a lot, Rich, to understand really who the stakeholders are and making sure that we've got you know the right level of, of discussions to, you know, to have with those key folks because it's 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 a variety and it is very different than you know typically tackling um, IT security. And um, yeah, and to add to that, like I think we have learned through the years that uh, bringing both uh, the stakeholders from IT and OT in the same room as we do risk profiling or the assessment of gaps to complement that view. And that does two things. First, it informs our assessment, but it starts that communication and dialogue within the organization. And uh, many organizations found that useful. And the other thing that's uh, interesting in the way that you bring a multifaceted team to do these audits is that you kind of take this assessment as a teaching moment. And we try to be sincere and transparent about when, you, when we find a gap, it's not just something that we put on paper, we say, we try to understand why the gap is there, if it's a resourcing problem, if it's the people or process or technology, and try to highlight really um, doable actions that they can do to achieve quick wins. So we try to be on their, on their side saying, these are the small steps that you can start with as you build in a stronger strategy or a risk management program. 
Okay, perfect. Yeah. I'm going to go to one final question that I know we need to go to wrap, um, which is from an organizational hierarchy structure, what can a small to medium sized company do if cybersecurity is under the control of the CIO instead of a dedicated security based executive? You know, and this is the absolute reality you know, within our, our Canadian environment. Um, and, uh, and, and we've seen it be quite successful. Now, so I, I almost want to re read through, you know, read in, in between the lines on that question, which is you know, that applies that maybe it's, it's not, um, you know, moving as uh, forward as smoothly as, as one might hope as a result of that. So, you know, we do believe that, that there's a, um, a merit in having a sep some separation of duties in that security should have a relative amount of independence versus the overall technical organization. IT or OT, but if that's not possible, it doesn't mean you can't set up some, some processes and some governance that at least allows for a discrete security discussion um, you know, that is not necessarily just influenced by um, IT as a whole. Um, you know, in that case, in the in-source, co-sourced, outsourced model, what we've seen is um, you can co-source or, or sometimes even you know, outsource that security role to come in and provide, um, you know, without a, a significant amount of cost, um, a good independent security eye that can look objectively at what security is required rather than what security can we do given our current IT, you know, architecture and infrastructure. You, you have to look at it separately from that. Um, so those are a couple of good good practices we've seen. Puneet, final comment from you? Yeah, Rich, uh, I, I would just, put a bit of uh, cloud spring to that. Uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, not, not the, the fact that cloud security, especially cloud security engineering, uh, has traditionally been a separate function. Now, what we are seeing now is to ensure the agility, we are seeing a lot more of cloud security engineering team, especially working uh, closely with platform engineering teams, uh, the infrastructure team, and, and that's just uh, even in the absence of a dedicated security function, as you said, yeah, we definitely need to ensure that there is, uh, there is a separation of duties, even if, uh, even if the reporting hierarchy is the same. I think the alignment is, is more in terms of how cyber risk or cloud adoption risks, uh, they get captured. Uh, and even in an absence of a dedicated security function, uh, you can still have the security engineering team with a bit of governance overlay to make sure that uh, those risks are identified and reported. Because and we are seeing that as, as almost a, um, as, as a pretty prevalent uh, practice. Good stuff. Okay. I know we're just at the top of the hour here, so I think it's probably the appropriate time to say thank you to everybody and to uh, turn the panel back to Farhan. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. And to Chris, Dan, Puneet, Iman for that excellent, very relevant discussion. Um, and Richard as well, thank you so much for moderating today's panel. Uh, that brings today's session to a close. And, and folks, that was our final webinar of 2020 for our CEA conversation series. Uh, but keep in mind, we will be back next year with more webinars and events in 2021. Uh, all of those can be found on um, our monthly newsletter, Current Affairs. Uh, you can also find um, information on that in our news and events section on, on our website, which is again, www.electricity.ca. In closing, uh, again, I would like to thank our panelists from PwC Canada and each of you for joining us today for our conversation series. Wishing you all a safe and joyous holiday season. We'll see you next year. Bye for now. <laughs>